redwood and spruce. So when you feel the flex. Rio Noah Bonk, 1974, on the Big Island of Hawaii, Honoka'a. We grew up listening to Hawaiian music, country music, um, R&B, anything from Johnny Cash to Doc Watson to The Beatles to Michael Jackson to rap music. Um, recently I've been listening in my car, like right now I have a uh, Bob Marley CD, uh, Little Dragon, um, what else do I have in there? Some Coldplay and a Hawaiian album. Yes, I, uh, I grew up, I learned, uh, violin first, and then I, and I, wasn't that interested in that, and then played guitar and ukulele, but uh, the older I get, the less I play. Um, I like to surf, so um, as much time as I can, I like to be in the water and uh, spending it going to the beach with my kids. also grew up diving. Um, we used to dive a lot, and... Um, I enjoy woodworking, just other things, building things for around the house, and that kind of stuff. When did I, I started making instruments when I was, my first instrument that I made by myself, I was in sophomore in high school. Um, but I grew up in the shop working, doing stuff, probably from the age of 10. Just little things, sanding, redoing tuners, taking things apart, stripping instruments, uh, doing repair, stuff like that. First instrument that I built for myself was a guitar out of a sophomore. And then I didn't start building ukuleles until um, after I graduated. So I would have been about uh, 19. Yes, I grew up in the shop, so... Uh, we had a repair business, which was the majority of the work at that point, and then we, my dad was building custom stuff on the side, um, high-end guitars, mandolins, um, and so I would help out do that, but mainly doing the repair work. And then when I got older um, and I decided that this is what I wanted to do, I went and got certified by Martin Guitar Company to do warranty work for them and Taylor and Fender. And then also spent some time at uh, Charles Fox, went took some classes with him, went up and did a little thing with Brian Gallup up in Michigan, because my dad knew all those people, so he would send me different places to learn different things from other people. And then when the demand for ukuleles was really, everyone kept wanting ukulele, ukulele, so he said, go figure it out, start building ukuleles, and so that's what I did. Um, over 20 years now, so 20, about 22 years of building ukuleles. Uh, Ko'olau came from when I, when I started building just the same, um, and taking it seriously, we decided we wanted, uh, because two different last names, because he's my stepfather, so, uh, we decided to come up with more of a, uh, a name that we can share. So the shop was over on Kaneohe side, and as you looked out of the shop, you could see the Ko'olau mountain range. So we decided to call it that. So it came from the mountains on the east side. So if you drive over there, they're very steep, very high, a lot of waterfalls, uh, and it just seemed fitting. Everybody that I've ever come across, for me, I think, um, Every builder that I've spent time with, every company that I've worked for, um, every being a part of the guild of American Luthiers, like you get their journals and you get to see all the different articles, you learn something from all of them. And I think you just take a little bit of uh, what you like from everybody and you make it your own. So 
and even working with Ryan now. Ryan works with me, and so um, there's things that I've learned off of him and I've taken from him that he probably does the same with us. I think that's what's unique about being a luthier is that um, you you take things from other people, but you make it your own. And so um, for me, like the first ukulele that I ever copied was a Martin tenor because I had that, I liked the sound. So as I, I used to repair like hundreds a year. You take it apart, you see what works, what doesn't work, and then you implement that. And then the more you build every year, it just changes and becomes more of what you are. And you, you tweak little things here and there, and you, you just get better and better the more you build. I can tell you who I respect right now. Okay, um, who do I respect? Casey, I think Casey Kamaka, he's an excellent builder. Um, he's very humble, he, he builds very nice instruments. Uh, Chuck Moore, um, he builds very nice instruments. I like his stuff. He's very artistic. There's a lot of uh, nice things that he does. Beautiful inlay stuff that he does too. Um, I've never met him, but the guy who does high ukuleles, recently I've seen, he's in Virginia, I believe. But yeah, he makes really nice instruments. So with my brother's store, I get to see all these instruments that come in through him that he sells. And so... Um, for me, when you look at the craftsmanship, the joinery, the playability, the finish, all the things that make a good instrument, um, like that's the kind of person when I look at his instruments, I'm like, he's legit. I, I can respect him as a builder. He builds in a completely different style as me in a lot of ways, but yeah. Um, Limana, Limana builds really nice instruments. Um, That's about it. Like I can think of off the top of my head, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of excellent builders nowadays. From when we started building ukuleles, it seemed like there was a handful of guys that were doing high quality professional instruments. And nowadays, there's a lot a lot of different guys doing that. I think what makes us a little bit different is that. <clears throat> I build more along the lines of a guitar. So a lot of guys in Hawaii or different places who start building ukuleles, they just built ukuleles and they approach it in a different way than guitar building was. But as guitar builders, you approach the instrument differently as far as bracing, um, body depth, size, I mean just a lot of different things. And I think when you come from a guitar standpoint first, you have um, you start off at a higher level of expectations mm. because the guitar world has standards set already and the ukulele the standards were never as high back in the day it seems like and the more and more those standards come the better everybody gets and so like the way we put our necks together we spray our bodies and necks separately um, that was never hardly anybody ever did that before um, our, our bracing is more along the lines of a classical guitar than like the way we glue the braces on, the type of glue we use, our kerf lining compared. So we approach it more like a small guitar and trying to get as much out of that instrument than just maybe looking for uh, the, the standard uh, high end of an ukulele sound. No, because it changes all the time. Because uh, something that I hear, maybe I finish this week and I get to play it for a little bit. And I'm like, oh, I really like this one. Um, a month later, there's going to be another one that I'm like, oh, I wish I could keep this one. So that that's the nice thing is that um, the more you build, you get to hear what works and what didn't work. Um, maybe like you can see like oh I, I tweaked this a little bit and so that worked out so then you appreciate that more and as a builder too like my preference in, in wood choices changes a lot because maybe one month I'm building a lot of koi instruments and then I build something like a rosewood and a spruce and so it's just so different that I enjoy that one 
more. And two, when I get certain types of wood, like maybe I get a really, I get 20 sets of just beautiful redwood, and every instrument I build out of it, I'm just really happy with because that wood was just perfect. Everything came out nice. And so there could be like six months where I'm like, I love redwood tops. But then I build a cedar top and it's like, uh, no, nah, I like cedar. So it changes all the time. Can I go too? Yeah. Okay. I would probably go uh, a Cuban mahogany back and sides. Um, with a redwood top, and the other one would be um, probably a Milo with a spruce top. Those two instruments, I like that sound. I like the deep um, tones, the mellowness that those woods give. And then working with um, Cuban mahogany, it's, it's, like, it's like a dream to work with. I mean, from a woodworker standpoint, and when you finish it, it just um, finishes great. And I like the fact that we don't stain anything, so naturally when you finish that, as the months go by, it just gets that reddish mahogany, it just starts to darken, like how they stain a lot of mahoganies now to get. And so, I don't know, to me, that's one of the ultimate woods, I really like it. It would be like, say if you're preparing food and you had a dull knife versus a sharp knife. Like if you had a knife from a Japanese master and he sharpened it for you and then you went to the grocery store and you bought just a generic knife and you're trying to cut a beautiful steak with it, that's what it's like. It just, it sands, it bends, it just, you can scrape it, um, the tone that you can get out of it, it's... To me, it's it's just a joy to work with, and I like and I like the grain color that you can get with it, especially the curly stuff. Some of the curly stuff, it just really just pops out, and um, it just produces a really nice instrument. I did just get one. <laughs> a very good friend of mine is a sushi chef, and uh, he went to the knife trade show and he got me a knife. Awesome. So. Just be, and I enjoy that too because uh, if I wasn't a luthier, I probably would have become a chef. So I, I did I did work in restaurants too, and I really enjoy that. Um, I love to cook, and so to me, it's it's like uh, in the shop having a good set of chisels. Like I love my Japanese chisels; they're just like far and beyond anything else. And then when I go home and if I cook with it. Like that knife, it's amazing. So, um, probably those same guys. I I would get one from Casey. I would order something from Chuck. I would order something from um, Hive. I mean, to me, those three, they're very different. They're very different builder types and very different sounds. But I would, I would be happy with whatever they build me. Let's say a customer orders an Alcoa instrument. Um, that kind of tells me that I know they're kind of going for a sound. Um, but it also tells me um, they might say, um, "But I like it a little bit more bassy, or I want a little bit more out of this, or I play this type of music." So. Um, when I'm building that instrument, first of all, I'm trying to get what my sound is, what I think is going to be the optimal sound, and then trying to cater to them. So, um, let's say I get a set, and it's very dark core, so it's very dense, and I flex it, and it's very stiff. So I know naturally it's going to be very mid rangey to treble. Okay, so I might um, uh, thin the back just a little bit more on that, and then maybe while, as I'm doing the top, do a lower profile on my braces, a little bit more rounded than higher peaked, to kind of cut some of that out, to warm it, liven it up a little bit more. And so as I'm building it, I'm constantly tapping it, trying to see the sound. And then for us, I'm going to tap the top, I hear the sound, I'm going to shave braces, I'm going to continue to carve those, 
then when I get it to where it's just right, I'll glue that top on. And then from there, we'll start to tap the box. And then we can start to sand the edges a little bit more, taper them out different places to kind of try and liven it up or try and achieve the sound that we're going after. No, I'm never going for a certain note. I'm going for a different, um, I guess it would be a note, but it's nothing that I'm like hooking up onto a meter. I don't do that. Like I don't hook it to a tuner and like, okay, everything's A sharp. I'm hooking it up to my ear, to what I know um, in my memory, like this is where it's at. You can just hear it open up. So as you have that top two as you're sanding, you're tapping, boom, boom, boom. You can hear it, like at a certain point, it will open up and you're like, that's that. And the point is, too, is like if you keep going trying to chase a different note, you can also weaken that instrument. And there's a lot of instruments that they sound good now, but I see like in five years, they're not going to still be together. They're going to implode on themselves or they're going to fall apart because people were so fixated, I think, on some a certain note. So that's just my philosophy. And, and I think, too, as a far as a repairman goes, as all those years that I repaired instruments, you see what goes wrong and goes right. Mm -hmm. And every piece of wood is different, so you can't always... Um, let's say if it was A, that piece of wood may not sound good at A. And so I think you can hear the difference. No. I don't think about that, and, and I've you know I've read a lot of those articles like tuning it and frequencies and and all those types of things and for me, if that works for you, that's great. But I've never heard an instrument where someone said this is what I do, and I heard it and I was like that changed my life. That that's the holy grail. And in your instruments like above here and we're all down here. And so I think everybody has to figure out what works for them. Okay, as you as a builder, what makes you build good instruments? If that makes you build good instruments, then that's your thing. And there's probably a lot of science behind it, but there's a lot of good instruments that were made from violins to cellos to pianos that were never built that way, and they sound just as good. So a lot of the instruments that we try and emulate as builders that are vintage instruments, they didn't build that way. And the other thing too is that um, a lot of people are chasing that vintage sound, but that instrument is 50 years old. And the more you play an instrument, the better it's going to sound and it comes into itself. So um, that's where also I see a lot of people like they chase that sound, but then they go, they don't build to last. And so, like I said, in five years, 10 years, it might not be around. It's never going to be a vintage instrument. It is right now, but it's not in the future. So you have to build for sound and tone, and to me, like tone is more important than volume or a certain note. It's like the overall tone of the instrument. I don't know. It to me, it's like kids, my kids, right? Like my kid is gonna be who he's gonna be. I can only work with him and try and hope that he's gonna be the best person that he's gonna be at the end. I can give him all the guidelines, but ultimately. You know, that piece of wood over there is never going to sound like this piece of wood over here. And if I try and make it, this one might fall apart and sound horrible, and this one would sound great. So, you gotta, I just approach it one at a time. Let's say you go to Komaka, you get Komaka ukulele, you get uh, Charlie's ukulele, you get maybe a Chuck Moore, you get all the different guys, right? They all have their own sound, right? And so, which one is best. There's no best. It's just whatever you like. And so everybody's building their own sound. And so uh, that's why I'm, the reason I'm saying that is because that question of like, should you tune it? Like someone like Casey, he may not think about that. Or maybe I don't think about that. Or maybe someone else doesn't think about it. The other guy may think about that. So when you hear all of our instruments together, they all sound good, but they all sound different. A kamaka is always going to sound like a kamaka. A gomes is always going to sound like a gomes. 
And so, to me, I think the person building it is 90% of it. That's 90% of it. Because who you are is related to that. Because as much as they do this or this or that, I think it's more of this guy than any of the other stuff. 